Hey listeners, welcome to another episode of Brown Girl Street podcast. This is your host Taman Tiwana and this is Kathy Thakur and both of us love reading books. On this podcast we bring our favorite books to you and discuss the parts that were most meaningful to us and how we found them interesting or relatable as brown girls. Today we are discussing Arlen Hamilton's memoir It's about damn time. which gives an insight into her journey of becoming a successful venture capitalist in the white male dominated silicon valley in 2015 arlen hamilton was on food stamps and sleeping on the floor of the san francisco airport with nothing but an old laptop and a dream of breaking into the venture capital business she couldn't understand why people starting companies all looked the same white and male and she wanted the chance to invest in the ideas and people who didn't conform to this image of how a founder is supposed to look hamilton had no contacts or network in silicon valley no background in finance not even a college degree what she did have was fierce determination and the will to succeed it's about damn time is a book or i should say an empowering guide to finding your own voice working your way into any room you want to be in and achieving your own dreams Arlen has given some really great advice and her accounts of her journey as one of the very few gay black women to start a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. Her journey is an inspiration. It's so full of lessons that I think we can all apply to our careers and our lives. And that's why we have also invited her to be on our podcast and I'm so excited for it. Yeah, me too. But you know, let's not give it all away. And before we get into our discussion, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free. There is creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast. in one place download the free anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today's episode is brought to you by restaurant.com with restaurant.com you can save at thousands of restaurants across the country with just a few clicks their dining deals range from $5 to $100 never expire and cost you a fraction of the face value dinner has never been easier with restaurant.com use for dine in take out or delivery Restaurant.com is offering our listeners 50% off their next purchase by going to www.restaurant.com/podcast. That's www.restaurant.com/podcast for 50% off your next purchase. Restaurant.com, the best deal every meal. The first thing that I want to address is something that's very apparent in Arlen's journey, which is the prevalence of gender bias and racial bias in the silicon valley i will just start by reading something that she has written in the book when talking about gender parity in venture capitalist funds and the gender pay gap some high level vcs talked constantly about hiring quote and quote the best person for the job and about not wanting to quote and quote lower their standards in order to accept women into higher paid jobs it's insane not to mention incredibly prejudiced misogynistic and homophobic to assume that the best of the best just happened to be 90% straight white males and yet that was the assumption and you know what this is something that i also have personally heard in some shape or form from men around me it's sad and i have never been able to understand how they can so openly say things like these i can't believe the sheer audacity to say these things in front of your own spouses when you are indirectly implying that just because of your gender you will never be the best hire yeah she also asks everyone to amplify the voices of those without a microphone and this is something that the world struggles with today like we are living in the world of excessive information but even friends or family don't usually support or amplify the voices of their peers who are trying to do something yeah that's true yeah and i have been recently been 
you know, seeing discussions about this on Twitter from entrepreneurs saying that their families and friends have never supported them, never bought anything from their business. And that's so sad. I don't know if it's jealousy or just indifference, whatever it is, it is super discouraging. And I'm sure it happens more with minorities than with men who look like the traditional CEOs, aka white men. I agree with you, Kathy. I think I have felt this thing too, on and off, that there definitely is a lack of support from friends and family in your personal endeavors or businesses. And it's actually really stark if you start noticing. And I've thought about it a lot. I feel like a big role is that all of us are inherently selfish, like myself included, and we only care about the things that we care about. So if we are all in different phases of life, like your friends are in a very different phase than you are in, our priorities look very different. And that's why when you have friends who are more into kids right now, more into family life, don't see your personal endeavors with the same importance as you do. And in the end, I know it's just sad that we fail to show up for each other with the support that we should be offering to the people in our lives. This also reminds me of something I saw recently on Instagram, which said, let's normalize business showers for friends who are starting new businesses. And I think, yeah, we should do it. Like, why are we only celebrating friends for when they're getting married or having babies? Why are we not celebrating them for other things that they are taking on in their lives like we can be whole people without just two or three main events in our lives oh yeah you know i saw a post on one of the tech communities on facebook that a woman created a website about throwing business showers it has recommendations on you know what kind of gifts to give your friends who are starting their own businesses and that's so awesome I wish I remembered the name of the site, but, you know, I think it's a really great initiative. Yeah, that sounds so cool. I think I'm going to look it up. Maybe I'll find the name because I think we could all do with more education around this, like how to support our friends in better ways. For sure. And I also want to come back to another thing that you had said earlier, how there's a greater lack of support for minorities. I read in this book itself that the founder of Y Combinator has publicly admitted that he can be tricked by Mark Zuckerberg lookalikes. And then there's another successful venture capitalist, John Doerr, who has publicly described his ideal founders as white male nerds. And when I read this, I was like, oh my God, how, how can someone openly say that? I know everyone has biases and we all have internal racial biases, gender biases and other biases. But the fact that you can just come out and openly say that it's so appalling. And yet that's the reality. Yeah, totally. I also heard another story recently where a group of guys, they were all black men. They were looking for funding. And one of the investors, he took them to the side and said something like, Look, I know this is not going to sound good, but I'm just going to be honest with you that you will not get funding because your team is too black. I mean, seriously, have you ever heard that a group of white men were denied funding because the funders thought that the team was too male or too white? I know. It seems like the world is definitely biased towards white men or men with money, which are again, white, mostly white men. And here's an interesting story, you know, on the same thing that we're discussing that happened with me. So during an interview in a Silicon Valley startup, the CTO of the company asked me, why do I want to switch jobs? And I was very honest about it. I said that my husband lives here, so I want to move from LA to the Bay Area. And that's why I'm looking for a new job. And then he was like, you know, so we are a startup, so you would be required to work on weekends. And since you're getting married, soon you will have a family. So do you think you would be able to spend time at work? And it was a really hot startup in Silicon Valley and they were paying a lot of money and, you know, a lot of stock options. But after this conversation, I decided that I don't want to work in this company. And it's so sad, you know, if you think about it, that women have to hide their marriages because they're judged if, you know, they're married, they would not have time to work. While men are not judged on the same basis. 
and then they have to hide the fact that they have children and some minorities have to hide their sexual orientation to get jobs in this world it's just horrible i know it's truly horrible and i'm so sorry that you had to experience this yourself it just sucks to be judged for the fact that you decided to get married while yeah. historically men have been given promotions when they get married or when they have children because now they have to support a bigger family so this man deserves a promotion and right. nobody sees the irony in that like you punish one gender for the same thing and you support another gender for the same thing and then you're like oh we don't know why there is this pay gap or disparity in the number of males and females in workforce you are creating that environment here right i've seen so many women who spend so much extra cerebral power to think about what they are going to reveal in their interviews like can they even tell they are married or when women get pregnant they have to weigh so much about the right moment when they can reveal it to their teens without facing any consequences or even like the inclination of being a whole person we definitely have long ways to go before we are actually an inclusive and diverse workplace in silicon valley because we all have seen companies hire one woman or bring one black person on board and like you know have the tag of a diverse workplace but that's not in a true sense and all of this is also a big reason why i find arlen's journey so admirable yeah and you know she mentions that when she was starting she didn't have the same resources available to her that are available to rich white men and you know for all the reasons that we discussed before this it was because she was a woman she was gay and you know this is something that stuck with me from the book like her grit or her willingness to succeed because she said that when you don't have money or assets you have to become the asset you have to learn it all by yourself and i think that's so interesting we are living in the age of free content available to us you know through books podcasts videos i really don't think that you have to get into a degree college to learn these things honestly i feel like no college can even teach you these things like you know the real world skills because the education system is so archaic now and it is not in sync with what happens in the real world although having said that i do understand that the system as it is today could make it difficult for someone without a conventional degree to get their foot in the door yeah i agree with that if we look at our own experiences yeah we have degrees but how much did we learn from the actual curriculum or the textbooks versus how much we took in from internet youtube videos wikipedia and other blogs and all right yeah of course like i always say that if google goes down one day i wouldn't know how to do my job <laughs> probably 60% <laughs> of true. my yeah yeah like any time i have to do a new project i have to first spend time on google to learn about those things before i can actually dive in right but even in the book arlen does mention that sometimes not having conventional education or experience can actually be a roadblock and i feel like we can easily see it around us talk to anyone who's looking for a job they will tell you about this roadblock if you just google a few job requirements right now you'll just find such ridiculous expectations some of them will ask for a bachelor's required a master's is also sometimes required then a mba is preferred on top of it then the person should have 8 to 10 years of relevant experience then you should be self motivated independent worker you should have great interpersonal skills you should be good at working with small and big teams when i see those i just feel like saying don't pick a lane first of all you are giving out an entry level position and you are asking for so much from the candidates it's also funny to me that some of things are just polar opposites like you want a individual contributor but that person will not always have the personality of a team player yeah you're so right these job descriptions are so scary and i'm so glad that we're talking about it because i'm about to go on a rant <laughs> like you know even if you have worked in a role for 6 plus years you will be doubting yourself and thinking if you fit in this new role and because of that i see so many graduate who are so confused about what they should focus on should they focus on building their own projects 
Should they focus on networking? Because that is also important. Should they focus on learning a new language from Udemy or million other online training websites? You know, I feel like this breaks them somewhere because it is so frustrating. Yeah. Like you spent a minimum of fifty thousand dollars on a degree, which is basically useless, and now you have to start from the bottom, and you are in education debt. The system is definitely broken somewhere, and it needs to be fixed. And like I said earlier, this is my rant. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> I know this whole process is just unrealistic, and it's highly frustrating. that is why i also picked something else from the book which i really wanted to add in our episode here so arlen has written that don't sleep when you are dead sleep when you are alive and can enjoy it and i think this is so powerful because up till a few years ago there was always this like hustle quotes which would be like sleep when you are dead and i'm like that doesn't even make sense first of all and how much can i produce or how much quality my work would have if i am like you know basically a zombie writing code yeah right and alan also writes to the companies i guess that when we ask employees to stay late or drop their weekend plans we are telling potential employees that if they have kids or caring responsibilities they should not bother applying when we make our employees feel as though they have to work until they drop every day and then come back and do it again we are telling potential employees with chronic illnesses not to apply and when we enforce evening socializing and happy hours we are telling our introverted colleagues that they are not as hard working just because they want downtime and alone time and by doing this we are cutting out a huge percentage of the workforce who could be the ones who turn the company around who are just as intelligent innovative and talented and when i read this i was thinking that it's so important for everyone to internalize both the employees and employers that we have to prioritize our health our self care and the well being of the people who work with us who work for us and we cannot expect humans to be working like robots yeah you know this is so true i actually loved her point of view on hustle like she said that hustle has a whole different meaning in silicon valley that you know you're not eating enough you're working constantly 24 hours and then people say that you know you're hustling but that is not what hustle means like you said you cannot be a great entrepreneur or a great employee if you're not taking care of yourself and that's so important and i love that she included that in this book another thing that you said you know when we enforce evening socializing and happy hours we're telling our introverted colleagues that they're not as hard working i have actually experienced that in my company like i don't want to go to happy hours if i don't feel like right but there are startups who take pride in weekly happy hours where people are getting drunk mindlessly and other people who want to spend time with their families instead they are forced to do that and the same employees who get drunk and have no responsibilities other than their work they make those other people feel like an outcast and also i think this becomes like a slightly different version of boys clubs that used to exist at workplaces where men would stay back women would have to go back home to see the family so the men would make better connections and networks and kind of amplify each other's careers so now it's just translated into people who go to happy hours they are making the connections outside of work then they can help each other network and rise up in their careers yeah that's so true since we are talking about you know work culture and our experiences i wanted to ask you something have you ever had an experience where you felt that your well-being was being compromised in the name of either work ethic or productivity or you were expected to be robotic in your performance by your employers yeah of course <laughs> at my previous job i think my mental health was seriously affected because of so many reasons but out of all those reasons there was one that is the most prevalent you know like there is a trend in startups today where they pick their star engineers or simply engineers who have been working for a long time in a company and you know they make them managers and these people don't necessarily have good managerial skills and these managers are not good at mentoring especially you know if they have employees who are just graduating and they come to work if they if it's their first job they need mentorship they need the right kind of support 
and so this happened with me like i had just graduated and the person who was my manager sucked at handling people it wasn't intentional it was just because he was promoted to a manager when he didn't want to become one at some point i think he made me believe that i wasn't productive and made me doubt my abilities as an engineer i realized it after that you know i wasn't a bad engineer he was just a bad manager yeah i have had a similar experience so i know exactly what you mean this definitely is a trend in corporate where there's just two tracks for engineers right they get promoted and become managers they get promoted and become architects nobody is testing the skill set or personality of people becoming managers it's just like eventually one day after a certain promotion level you become manager as a result especially for people who are starting out like you said it's so much lack of guidance and lack of mentorship and you know the person is just lost in their first job and that can be so detrimental because you are just starting out and if your first belief is that you are in the wrong place then it might just you know discourage you from taking that path or it just cause so much distress in you yeah you're absolutely right and you know i have also had experience with a different breed of managers who we all call micromanagers who expect you to function at 100% capacity 100% of the time after my experience with such people i understood that quote which i've seen on linkedin that people don't leave companies people leave managers yeah that is so true i have really come to believe this i feel like this is where the importance of managerial trainings at workplace get highlighted for me companies should train their managers to yes i i absolutely believe that don't just promote people to like change their titles make sure they can be actually good managers managing someone doesn't mean bossing around managing someone doesn't mean thinking of them as your personal secretary it's actually a very nuanced skill that not everyone has yeah i agree and you know since we're talking about mental health i feel like all of these experiences that we get in our jobs and our professions really affect your confidence and your mental health arlen makes a really great point about how to take care of yourself and one of her tips is that she encourages everyone to have a hobby and by hobby she means that something that you do for yourself and something that you don't have to worry about monetizing and that's because she says that when your quality of life improves your work improves and that's so true you know like in this instagram age i feel like everyone is trying to turn their hobbies into something that they would like to monetize and that's really great that's not a problem but it doesn't seem very healthy to me at the same time because once your hobby becomes your work i feel as if the fun goes out of it yeah i agree with that 100% and this is something i have communicated to my friends multiple times i think that if you put the pressure of money making on your hobby on something you love you will end up hating that thing one day there is a huge focus on enjoying your work and sometimes it does feel like if i enjoy doing something i might as well you know get paid out of it but arlen puts it as try to do something that you're doing solely out of passion and creativity alone so on that note i would like to ask you a question david what is that one hobby of yours that you do out of passion and creativity alone and not to monetize i think for me it would have to be my doodles full disclosure i do have an instagram page but the function of it is more of cataloging for me because i like to go back and see what i've created and makes me feel good but if you would follow me and if you pay attention i'm not consistent i don't see it as something i have to do with this like strong work ethic for me it's just totally a hobby for me and me alone and like you said everybody suggests you know monetize the things that you like to do i have also gotten a lot of advice on monetizing the doodles but in my heart that just doesn't translate you know I, there are days when i doodle all day and there are weeks when i don't feel like doing it at all but i just come back to it in big or small ways whenever i feel like it and i feel it's good for my soul i'll give you an example recently i had a call which was kind of stressful and the entire time i was doodling as a way of stress relief without even realizing it 
by the time the call ended i had made something pretty out of a very sucky phone call <laughs> that's actually awesome right i mean if i see your tutors i would be like yes you can monetize but <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you thank you <laughs> But you know it's okay. Like you can. Yeah, I don't want to put pressure on those because then the quality will go down. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, and for me, I think it's writing. Like I write poems and I write short stories and I write down my thoughts into the format of like you know those terribly tiny tales. But I feel like I just do it for myself, like not to show it to the world or to monetize it. How do I not know about this, Kathy? <laughs> Because it's just for myself. <laughs> Come on, send some to me. I want to read it. <laughs> yeah, sure. I will do that for sure. <laughs> I I sense insincerity in your tone, but <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> Since we are also talking about Instagram and also things that we love to do, I think I want to address another Instagram buzzword, which is authenticity. Oh yeah. I love her chapter on being unapologetically authentic. She is basically telling people to be authentic and not to be fake like how the social media or the world in general would want you to be. And I think it is very true because if you are not authentic in your profession or in your personal life or even on your Instagram, you know, people will sense that eventually. And it would also affect you in some way. like for example you know for the longest time i felt that i am not being authentic in my profession and i was tired of faking my personality to fit into this image of an ideal software engineer so you know everyone knows that an ideal software engineer doesn't talk much they are mostly categorized as introverts who don't like big gatherings <laughs> <laughs> and you know i was surrounded by people like that and i was trying so hard to conform to that culture and i sucked at it but after a while i realized that i am not one of those engineers at all i love talking to people getting to know their stories and connecting with them i and i think that was the time i became authentically myself i am never letting it go because i am having an insane amount of fun <laughs> so <laughs> so i want to ask you have you had struggles with being authentically yourself like you know at some point in your life where you were trying to fit in by not being your true self You know it's funny that my experience with this is also with the image of a software engineer but our reasons are totally different like I'm an introvert so no issues there but I think I could not wear the mask of a tech geek which I felt there was always the expectation to be I'm more of a creative person who loves to be an individual contributor but when i was in this role of a software engineer i was constantly stressed out because i kept feeling that i have to show up as this person whose hobby is also coding whose lunch conversations are also around programs and solutioning and i felt like i could never bring my real authentic self to work i could never be that slightly different person who has a different approach or a different outlook on things That's so true you know I felt the same Arlen also talks about building a community or being part of a community because you know the right communities can support you so much through your tough times and celebrate with you in your good times and when you're part of a community you see that you're not alone and there are people like you out there Yeah I agree I think having a good support system or a community that you can rely on can be really helpful for our growth and our careers Right Okay, I think we are almost at the end of our discussion, but before we end, I have one last question for you, Daman. So, Arlen mentions that she wrote her own headline that she wanted to see in the future for herself, and that came out to be true a few years down the line. And you know, I've also heard stories of people doing that. It's basically like a pocket-sized vision board. So, my question to you would be, what's the headline you will write about yourself? That's a tough one, but maybe not. I think I have wanted to write a book for forever, I guess, and that's a dream. I think that has never gone away. So I think my headline would be around that as well. Something like the Montevana's debut novel makes New York Times bestseller list. I think that sounds good. 
Oh wow, I love that. And I can definitely <laughs> see your debut novel going to the bestseller list one day. Oh, thanks for the blessing, Kathy. <laughs> I think I would just go completely insane writing my headline. So it would probably be something like, you know, Kathy Thakur becomes the next prime minister of India. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Imagine in future I would already have a connection with the next PM of India. <laughs> I have so many corrupt ideas in my head right now. <laughs> no, I don't want to be the corrupt prime minister. I want to be a nice one. Like, you know, <laughs> um, Anil Kapoor in Nayak, like that Hindi movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that movie. So are you also going to have like uh, sensational background music for you the entire time? Oh, yeah, of course. Like and whenever I'm walking into the crowd, it'll be like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Okay, now it's time for brownie points. But before we talk about brownie points, let's give a shout out to the listener of the day. Our listener of the day is Savi Kaur. She says that I am not an avid reader. In fact, I had not even read the book Becoming before listening to the first podcast. Yet, I enjoyed listening to the episode so much. These are much more than just book reviews. It's just like listening to a story. I love the parallels they draw from their personal lives and also relating them to the Indian culture. Listening to them has definitely motivated me to read more. I now try to read the books before a new episode is released to make the experience even better. Love the way these ladies are sharing their passion for books with the world and I would highly recommend this channel to everyone. Thanks, Avneet. Thanks, Avneet. That's so nice. Okay, now it's time for brownie points. I would like to give one brownie point to this book because I love how honest and transparent writing style is. She cuts right to the point. I can only imagine how meeting her would be like, right? Just straightforward conversations, no beating around the bush. I'm so excited to meet her. Yeah, I could totally see that. I would also like to be an observer of a meeting she's running. Like, I think that would be a great experience to watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would give another brownie point to this book because I love the books that I can underline the quotes in, I can highlight the books. And this one was like a treat for me. I had not even finished the introduction chapter and I had already highlighted about six quotes. Yeah, I know. It's an amazing, you know, motivational read actually. I would also like to give one more brownie point because she covers a lot of topics topics that are extremely relatable even though we aren't entrepreneurs and from the book you can actually get a sneak peek into her mind and understand how hopelessly optimistic she is yeah and i was just amazed by her self learner spirit like i can only imagine how much discipline how much grit and perseverance one would need to learn something from scratch and just go after what you want in your life Yeah it's so inspiring. This was a discussion on the book It's about damn time by Arlen Hamilton. We definitely encourage you guys to pick it up. It's a super relatable read and even if you're not interested in becoming an entrepreneur her lessons and advice and her journey in general would definitely inspire you. For our next episode we are bringing the amazing Arlen herself to you and we will be discussing more about her book and her life experiences as a woman of color making it in the silicon valley until then keep listening thank you for listening to this episode of brown girls read podcast if you like what you hear please leave us a five star rating and a comment you can support us at anchor.fm/browngirlsread/support Your support will allow us to continue this podcast and bring more episodes to you. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Instagram Brown Girls Read Pod and Brown Girls Read One on Twitter. If you have book recommendations for us, you can leave us a comment or message on our social media, and you can also subscribe to us on YouTube for more content.